back a few years ago uh, at AFPI, and it just shows how research can uh, come back to life again. Uh, whenever I started in AFPI nearly 20 years ago now, we had a number of studies that looked at the lifetime performance of cattle, and uh, over a three or four year period, we, we took cattle in. And the scenario I'm going to look at mainly tonight is looking at uh, finishing Herefordshire steers at uh, 24, well, steers at say 22 to 24 months, or heifers at say 20 to, to 22 months. And really what uh, we did in those studies, we looked at altering the planning nu nutrition at various stages of the life cycle, and then what is the long-term implications of that. So tonight I'm gonna, gonna share some of that, but the whole background to this, to these studies was really around compensationary growth. Uh, Gareth has mentioned it a few times tonight, but really just to define what comp compensationary growth is, it's really the time, it, it's the growth, the extra growth you get after a period of restricted growth. And I borrowed a, a, do this. Uh, I borrowed a, a, a graph here from Chagas, and really what it shows is uh, two, two lines on it. Uh, one is unrestricted growth, just assuming cattle, your cattle grow on at uh, maybe point, point 0.8, or even let, let's call that straight line is the equivalent to a, a kilo per day. But actually, if you restrict the animals to, say, 0.7 per day, uh, once you put them onto a, a, another plane of nutrition, no better nutrition, you actually get maybe 1.2 kilos per day. And yet, if you look at the nutritional that you're providing them, they would only be predicted to maybe do a kilo a day, but you might be getting an extra 0.2, and that's the compensatory growth you get there. And you know, it has been used for years, this, this model, uh, to possibly restrict feed in a certain part of the life cycle and then actually get compensation. Very often, pre-turnout, we would actually look at actually feeding, uh, taking the concentrates off cattle maybe in a month pre-turnout, and then once they hit the grass, you'd get that compensation there. So there's a little bit of savings there. But what we did in these studies was just look at uh, a number of studies and what was the impact of actually restricting growth rate uh, for that whole for that whole uh, win winter feeding period. So within these studies, we looked at sort of winter one, then the summer grazing period, and then winter two was the finishing scenario. So this was assuming we were buying calves out of the, uh, in fact, for those studies, we did buy many calves out of, out of, out of Enniskillen and, and, and various markets. So studies generally started about November time, cattle were turned out in normally end of March or April, then housed uh, about maybe October, and then finished uh, out of the house at, at, at various periods of time. So really study one, and in study one we had three different concentrate levels. We had either zero meal, a kilo and a half of meal, or just under four kilos of meal. And I suppose really what uh, the data I'm going to present tonight is uh, I've been selective at what I'm, what I'm presenting, but first of all was the silage dry matter intake. And you can see how the intake declines as the concentrate level increases. And that is important to remember for anyone that uh, maybe was short of silage. Now I know this part of the world uh, it was maybe a good season, but certainly over where, where I come from and more in the east of the province, uh, certainly we were hit harder with the, with the dry spell. And there is a lot of people facing this winter with a lot less silage. But it is important to note that if you do take concentrates out of the system, or even if you normally feed concentrates or plan to reduce that, do, do be prepared for the cattle to eat more, eat more silage. In this scenario, we'd, the concentrate levels uh, based, were based on the quality of the silage, but we were planning to have either 0 0.3, 0 0.7, or a kilo of a day live weight gain, and by and large, we, we got that. So just looked at the, at the turnout weight, so come the following spring, the calves on no meal were uh, 42 kilos lighter than those that got a kilo and a half, and they were actually 36 kilos lighter than those that got four kilos of, of meal. So a, a huge difference there in, you know, in, in the performance, and that's obviously important for someone that's maybe selling calves, but if you're actually putting them out to grass yourself and taking them through the finishing, the important thing to see is actually that huge difference declined uh, by housing time, uh, albeit by it came to the final slaughter time, uh, whenever we were slaughtering these, uh, there was still a difference between the cattle on the knot and 1.5 kilos, there was 20 kilos or 18 kilos of difference uh, there. The other group, there was 11 kilos. It actually wasn't significantly different, but there was still 11 kilo of a difference. And these cattle were finished 
whenever they were housed the second winter, they were finished over about 100 uh, days. So it just shows that they, over that sort of like relatively short finishing period, uh, reducing the performance from 0.7 to 0.3 did have a long-term impact on the lifetime performance of those cattle. So for anyone that is deciding to write, let's drop concentrates out of the system, do be prepared for a long-term effect uh, and it might be difficult to fully compensate for that. There was another study, a second study, and in it we had, uh, I want to sort of present slightly different data this time, but again we had 0.3 or 0.7 kilos of, of live weight gain during the winter time, and that was uh, achieved through feeding either 0.5 during the first winter or take two kilos during the first winter. The following winter, you know, the second winter, we uh, took these same cattle in. They were so both mixed up really whenever they and had a common grazing period. And then they come back into the house and were offered four kilos. And in this case, whenever they were finished over a longer finishing period, th this particular year, it was a 140 day finishing period. Uh, there was still, whenever we got to, to slaughter, uh, the ones that were restricted to the 0.3, uh, they had a carcass weight nine kilos lighter than the ones that were offered uh, four, or sorry, two kilos dur during the first winter period. So again, in that scenario, you can see there was a long-term impact of reducing the, the performance uh, of those animals whenever they were on a, a relatively low level of meal during the finishing period. The same group of cattle, uh, but whenever some of the cattle were housed, they went on to ad lib meal, so, or were worked up onto ad lib or a high level of meal. And you can see actually in that case, there was full compensation. Uh, so the cattle got, got up to the, to the, to the carcass weight, uh, so up to the 377 kilos, so they bo both were the same. So actually that would indicate if you're going to have a high plane of nutrition you know, later in life, uh, for a long period of time, you, these cattle were fully, fully compensated. So actually reducing that kilo and a half of meal during the first winter period in what's last is about 120, 130 days, uh, actually that meal you could almost say w w was wasted. Uh, there, there was no difference there. <coughs> but I suppose now I haven't presented economics tonight but just using similar economics to what uh, Gareth was mentioning based on where concentrates are today and where silage costs are today uh, actually uh, from an economic perspective the, the, you know, the, the low concentrate system even though it's producing the lowest carcass weight there would actually be the most economical system uh, but, but that said uh, we do have to consider in that system, you know, you're, you're into a light carcass weight, the overall value of the animal will, will be lower and actually getting the fat cover will be, uh, will be poorer as well. So, uh, and like the sheep, if you drop down into a fat class one, there is a fairly heavy penalty on, on the carcass for that. So you just have to be careful. So I think it is important that if you are going to reduce you new know, performance during one period of life, it is important to think you know, long term, uh, you know, you're going to have to offer a higher level of performance later on. So if you're thinking, right, this year we'll feed no meal because it's too expensive. If meal falls back next year, that might be good. But certainly where we are at this stage, it's not looking like I know a year's a long, long period of time. But if meal continues to be there, you could have a long, by feeding none this year, you could have a long term implication there. So just, I think it's the, the, the message is just, just be careful. Thinking ahead, you know, there's not much profit in, in the whole thing, as Gareth has already mentioned, but uh, we do know that grass is the cheapest feed available for cattle. So what I'd be saying to people this year is, you know, look at trying to maximise the amount of grass you can get into the, into the diet. For, uh, in some of our studies, we looked at turning cattle out early and turning them out late. And actually by turning, even, even one study there where they were just turned out three weeks earlier, the 5th of May, April, relative to the 22nd of April, and uh, that had a long term and was a significant difference uh, in terms of carcass weight. The animals that were turned out early were five kilos heavier carcass weight. So five kilos at four pound a kilo was worth about 20, 20, 20 to 25 pound uh, at the moment. And that's not to be laughed at. Burn and, and also remember that, uh, and that's only, you know, in terms of extra carcass value, but there were savings there in terms of uh, meal and in terms of silage. So it is important to get cattle out there early. More recent study that we did at Hillsborough, we looked at actually keeping cattle out at grass a little bit longer. 
and this was light store cattle, light weanlings, and we kept them out for, we actually were able to keep them out uh, right through to January. Uh, it was a dry, dry, drier season, okay. But uh, the, the point really, whenever we compare these to cattle that were housed in average quality grass silage and meal, the performance was very, very similar. So it just shows you actually the value that if there is grass available and you've grass available, uh, don't underestimate the quality or you know the, the quality of that grass in terms of giving you performance, provided the cattle aren't tramping the life out of the ground, but certainly light weanlings could be kept out slightly longer and it would reduce the amount of silage they're eating and it would reduce the amount of meal you have to feed and potentially give uh, you know give, 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 give a good return there. So again, just really try to maximize the, the days at, at, at grass. And I suppose just the other point on both spring grass and autumn grass, based on a lot of the silage qualities that have been analyzed this year, a lot of them are quite, quite poor. Grass in itself uh, is actually high, high quality. And if there is grass there at the moment, it is worth taking it off, particularly on maybe silage land, uh, rather than letting that there lie all winter. Uh, and potentially, you know, if you're not going to be grazing it off in the spring before harvesting, it might be worthwhile con considering letting some light stores graze that off. Uh, and you know, if you can keep them out an extra week or an extra two weeks, it could help to, to lower the cost. And the sward you, you then harvest next year might be of a higher quality, to, and that might actually help help next year's uh, silage quality. So just don't underestimate the, the potential in, in grass. Another question we're often asked is, is there any point in feeding cattle at grass? And I've looked at a number of studies that we did at Hillsborough. Uh, some of them were with a short finishing period on, in round sort of for heifers 60 days, for uh, steers 100 days. And I also looked at some longer finishing periods where the, the cattle, the heifers were maybe 120, 100, 100 plus days in the house, steers say uh, 140 days in the house. And really what we found looking at these studies uh, uh, where we introduced meal at about the 1st of August. So whenever grass quality started to decline, we introduced about two and a half kilos of meal and fed that right up until, until housing time. And housing time differed actually between these two studies, but certainly in the shorter finishing period, we did find uh, where, where there were going to be cattle were going to be housed and then finished after hundred less than 100 days. There was a 12 kilos more concentrate or 12 kilos more carcass uh, when them cattle were slaughtered. But when we put them in and kept them for a longer finishing period, there was actually no, no difference in performance. So really in that study three, that, that particular example, those cattle, there was no, comp there was, there was no, almost the cattle with no meal fully compensated, uh, you know, the, the up and there was no difference. So really in that longer keep system, it, was, it wasn't worthwhile feeding, feeding concentrates at, at grass. In this system, obviously you're getting 12 kilos more uh, carcass uh, but the thing to remember is you're putting in 250 uh, kilos of, of meal to get that 12 kilos of carcass. And at this stage, based on where meal prices is, there's probably only, uh, probably the meal man was getting 20 pound and you were getting, getting nothing. You might have been better with the slightly light, lighter carcass, albeit you just do have to keep an eye on, on the fat cover. Stocking rate, uh, across a number of studies, we looked at different stocking rates, either a high or low stocking rate. Uh, all cattle were on a similar, all, all the land was treated the same in terms of the amount of fertiliser went on uh, and, and cattle were in a rotational grazing system, moved every five, six days. But uh, there was two studies again with a short finishing and a long finishing period. And in both those studies, whenever you reduced the stocking rate, whenever you put more cattle out and basically grazed the cattle tighter. So essentially what happened in the springtime, uh, the, uh, there was more rate of cattle, so it was with seven, 78 cattle went out on the uh, high stocking rate and uh, about five, five to five and a half cattle, or the equivalent to, it was the equivalent to sort of 270 or 2.7 tonne of beef was turned out to one system and uh, two tonne of beef was turned out to the other system. And, uh, the, the, and that's sort of maintained at that throughout the grazing season. And in that system, you can see uh, over a fairly long grazing period of about 200 days, there was a difference in both cases of about 14 or 11 kilos of, 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 of carcass gain. So really by restricting the cattle uh, during the summer by having the different stocking rate, you're having an impact uh, that didn't fully compensate over the winter time. So again, really increasing the stocking rate. And really the reason behind that was increasing the stocking rate. It reduced the grass availability. 
that subsequently reduced the performance of the cattle uh, and they did not fully compensate during the finishing period. And some people might ask, why on earth are you presenting that? We all know what stocking rate we have. And really, uh, we, we do, but uh, I suppose this, this next slide is what I, I want to maybe focus on. And what is the impact of reducing nitrogen application? I've heard a lot of people saying this spring, fertilizer's 2D are not buying it. But there is a knock-on effect of that. If you reduce the amount of fertilizer you put on, you're reducing the amount of grass that you actually grow. And this has certainly came, been quite clear this year with some uh, grass track data at Hillsborough. We've been cutting plots every three weeks. So the blue line represents the uh, 270 kilograms of nitrogen, the red line uh, 135 kilos, and the, the gray line 67 kilos of nitrogen. And you can really see the difference there in growth. There was a previous, we haven't quantified it yet, but we're still measuring it. But uh, about two years ago, we had a previous study where we, 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 we had zero uh, fertilizer and we grew just under seven ton. We had 90 kilos of fertilizer uh, and we grew over eight ton and we had 180 kilograms and we grew over 10 ton. So uh, it just shows, you know, once you reduce the nitrogen, you're reducing the amount of grass uh, that you grow. So if you're going to go down that road and maybe even going down that road again next year, just be aware you're, there's going to be less grass available for the cattle. And as a result, if you're planning to reduce your nitrogen level, plan to uh, readjust your stock, stocking rate. So essentially consider uh, less cattle on the farm. The other point I want to make is uh, we are seeing climate change is starting to have a, have a bit of an impact and we are starting to see maybe over this neck of the country and maybe speaking out of line but certainly uh, we are seeing in Hillsborough and on Greenmount we are seeing uh, implications and differences in growth rate and really the time you get the best response is earlier in the season to fertilizer that's when you get the best response so uh, I know Goodness knows where fertilizer levels or what the feelability will be in the springtime. But certainly if you look at this gra graph, the best responses were earlier in the season. So if you were putting on nitrogen in uh, April or May, you were getting a good response. Once it's got to later in the season, that level of response was less. So actually your return on investment is less later in the season. So just don't miss that peak, peak period of growth. I know sometimes when you do get that peak period of growth, people say, well, I've almost too much grass. But actually making this year having silage in the silo is, is, is as good as having money in the bank. So just, just don't under, underestimate that. Uh, but certainly if, you're, if you are buying fertilizer deer, you do want to get the response to that, to that nitrogen. I want to finish off tonight with just a couple of slides on when to slaughter cattle. And we all know uh, carcass is made up of, of muscle fat and bone. Uh, and depending on the genetics of the animal, but as the animal gets, gets closer to slaughter weight, you're getting muscle, but you're also getting more and more fat put on. And really, uh, once you put fat on, uh, fat, subcontinuous fat in the carcass, yes, you do want to get your fat class three uh, or, or as close there as, as possible. But once you're putting fat on, you're not only putting fat on the, on, on the carcass, you're also putting fat internally. And once the animal slaughtered, that internal fat uh, you know, it drops out of the carcass, you're not getting paid for it. So you're wanting to put as little of that on as possible, particularly with the, with the prices of, uh, of, of feed costs at the moment. As I say, it's, it's very hard to put a weight on it. Uh, continental cattle will obviously go, uh, are much leaner and will take more, more uh, go much heavier weights than, than, than native breeds. Uh, and again, dairy, dairy, dairy genetics are particularly poor at feed conversion efficiency. So again, consider slaughter them at, at, at slightly, slightly lighter rates. Obviously, there's breed, uh, significant variation within the animals. So it is important to walk your animals when, uh, and when you're weighing them, just to monitor the, the weight gain off the animals. And generally what you find is cattle get heavier. They don't actually put as much weight gain on. So Gareth talked about you know, monthly or even more frequent. And certainly once you see that the, 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 the weight gain is starting to decline, uh, provided there's, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in good enough uh, condition and good enough fat cover, uh, really consider getting them out, out of the system, particularly now that feed costs are, are so high. Again, that just shows feed conversion efficiency, shows how uh, 
although suckler cattle and the likes of good, uh, you know, uh, continental cattle, as we often see over here in the West, are, are very, very efficient, and suckler bulls are very, very efficient. As they get heavier, that feed conversion, see, feed conversion ratio declines, and it's just, again, an indication that, uh, you know, sl- don't take them to really heavy weights. Consider, consider slaughtering them earlier simply because of the, 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 the feed costs. But I think the key thing is just to monitor the performance and walk your cattle regularly and monitor your performance and also monitor the production costs. If concentrates and, and your silage availability you know, are, are increasing in price, just, just monitor and review your, your feeding strategy as you go forward. Just a few take-homes. Uh, compensatory gr- growth, it can be used to reduce concentrates, but just be careful that you don't over over don't try to make too much out of the compensatory growth and do remember that it does take a high plane of nutrition in the future to, to fully compensate for that and bear in mind if concentrates are expensive now but if they don't get any cheaper you know you could end up with very light cattle next year or the following year when you go to slaughter them say grass you know there is good nutritional quality in autumn and spring grass so so and it can be used to, to minimize or to, re- to replace some concentrates and silage for, for them younger, younger weanlings. Uh, feeding concentrated grass, there's uh, will boost performance, but at a cost, so just be careful on that one. And again, reducing nitrogen application, it will reduce grass production, but that will, you do need to then consider reducing your, your stocking rate. And just really uh, monitor performance of finished cat, finishing cattle, indeed all cattle, relative to the to the production cost.